hello. Hello, hello, and welcome. So today, today I am going to talk about anatomy of the spine. Now over the last couple of weeks I have shared with you about the anatomy of the breath. That was my first lecture that I gave to you all about the lecture of the breath breathing, the importance of the breath, the importance of our thoracic cage, which is going to be part of the spine that we are going to be looking at today. And then last week, which I have to say I got a little bit mixed up, um, I spoke about the foot, the anatomy of the foot and the importance about our balance and our ability to be able to accommodate to uneven surfaces. That's if we don't wear these neurological blockers shoes which can compromise our input neurologically, can compromise the neurological uh, input back into our spine. And doesn't allow our feet to work in the best manner that they can. So today we are going to look at the spine. Now unfortunately up here you can't quite see Charlie's head. But Charlie is in here. If I give you a little bit of a, whoop, a tip up there. There he is. So we are going to be looking at the spine from top to bottom. Here we go. I'm going to spin my little Charlie around. And we can see from top to bottom looking at the different regions of the spine, the neck, the mid back and the lower back. Okay. And these areas of our spine have different names and those different names and those different regions have different numbers of vertebrae within the spine. So let's look at that first. Let's start to have an appreciation of the structure. And once we look at the structure of the spine, then we can appreciate the functionalities of it. Okay. So um, let's have a look, first of all, within Charlie here, little, little mini, mini me, Charlie. We have the area, oh, I'm getting my left and right, looking into the camera, not at the, uh, not at the skeleton. So here we have a neck, okay. The vertebrae of the neck are called the cervical spine. And in the cervical spine, we have seven vertebrae. And those seven vertebrae are the smallest of the structures throughout the whole of the spine. They don't have a huge degree of weight bearing capacity. They only have our head, of which our head roughly weighs about five to six kilos, let's say, depending on how big our brains are. So we have uh, seven vertebrae of the neck. And then we come down to the region that I was speaking to you about two weeks ago, which is the thoracic spine. The, the thoracic spine that makes up the back aspect of the rib cage. That we can see some of these ribs coming all the way through to the front of Charlie and those ribs there attaching onto the sternum. Oh, this way, sternum. So we have the 12 thoracic vertebrae with 12 ribs either side, so we have 24 ribs in total. And then down in the back here, within our lumbar spine, we have five lumbar vertebrae. Now, I remember somebody telling me this and I quite liked it, so I do use it. Imagine that you have breakfast at seven o'clock, seven cervical spine. We have an early lunch at 12, 12 thoracic spine. And then we have a really early dinner or tea at five o'clock. So seven, 12 and five. This is in most of us. There are a few anatomical variations, of course, within our world. And some people may be born with a sixth lumbar vertebrae, for example. And other people may be born with extra little ribs coming out of the seventh cervical spine region. So that there are the regions of the spine, cervical spine, thoracic spine, and lumbar spine. Now, what sits on top of 
the cervical spine. It's our head, our big head that we have, that as, as I was saying to you, weighs quite a lot, doesn't it? Five, six kilos. That's a lot of, lot of weight for our whole body to be coping with. I mean, imagine if our head's a little bit forwards, like we are in this day and age with this 21st century archetypal posture, with five, six kilos coming forwards, opposed to being stacked on top of our body, then we are in the, uh, then we have the ability to be able to balance and the efficiency of our muscular system, thumbs up. So our postural alignment is really important and we'll get into a little bit more of this. Um, okay, so we have the head that sits on top of the spine. And then what do we have at the other end? At the other end here, we have the sacrum. And the sacrum is fused of five rudimentary vertebrae, okay? This was our originally our tail when we were more of a quadruped on all fours that we had a tail. And then below that, we have the tailbone right down here, our coccyx, okay? So we have this amazing triangular sacrum and then we have that little tailbone on the end, the coccyx. So this is, overall, this whole region is called our axial skeleton, our main central part of our skeleton. And then we have these appendages, our upper extremity, and our lower extremity, let me just take this one off, and our lower extremity that then comes to obviously continue into our spine, our axial skeleton and our appendicular skeleton. There's a nice one there on Charlie's, Charlie's leg that I can pull apart, and then we can pop it all back together. Okay, let's get that pelvis back together so he feels a little bit more whole. God bless you. Okay. So, spine, cervical spine, thoracic spine, lumbar spine, head on the top, sacrum at the bottom, connecting and creating through the whole pelvis region. So, if we look at that structure, that structure as our spine, what do you think our functions are? What do you think the functions of the spine are? Because it's got a huge, huge, huge sense of, if we look at this structure here, this structure here is the spinal cord that goes through our spinal column, our spine. So it has a huge protective function of our most beautiful, sensitive structure of our nervous system. What's this red thing? What is this red structure that sits in between two vertebrae and sits throughout all of our spine other than right up at the very base of our skull top of our cervical spine the c1 and the c2 c1 and c2 we do not have a disc within that region okay so every other segment within our spine has a disc now what is that disc for what is the importance of the disc? The disc here, as we see, has a sense of force distribution, has a sense of cushioning, has a sense of being able to cushion and distribute forces from below and from above. So this front part here of our spine, this is the front and this is the back. We can feel those little bony prominences through our spine and these are those bony prominences. So at the front, we have distribution of force. We have a sense of cushioning. In the middle, wow, we've got this sense of protection. Ex uh, protection of this amazing, fragile, sensitive neurological system that we have. And then at the back, what have we got at the back? Can you see what's actually coming apart? Have a look and hear where my finger is sitting. What happens here is this is one of the intervertebral joints. 
we have intervertebral joints between every single vertebrae. And what happens at joints? Any joint in our body, what happens? Movement. So dissipation of force, protection and movement. We have this ability of movement to be happening more so through the back region of our spine. Now, what movements happen in our spine? What movements can you do? Have a play around. I can look over my shoulder, which that movement's called rotation. I can allow my left ear to drop to my left shoulder, and I can go the opposite way. This way is called side bending. And then we have another movement called flexion and extension. So these joints within our spine can move in all different directions, as maybe you may have experienced in relation to yoga. When we're doing yoga, we can do forward folds, flexion. We can do back bends, extension. We can do our side angle triangle, our triangle pose, which is side bending both ways, or even a side plank, for example. That's also within that same axis of movement. And then we've got our most beautiful twists. Twists within yoga are our rotation. So what is our aim? If we've got these seven, 12, five vertebrae in our spine, our aim is to get segmental motion between each of those vertebrae. Because if you imagine a whole chunk of my vertebral column not moving together, uh, we're gonna be moving in quite a chunk. And we want to have a sense of force distribution equally through our spine to be able to dissipate force, which is a lot of what our body is about, dissipating force for walking and jumping and skipping and all those functional activities in life. And we can see here that the spine has been intricately designed to be able to uh, create all of those functions. Now, there are things that can obviously go wrong within our spine, whether it's the disc, whether it's the bodies, whether it's close to where the nerves are, or whether it's those little joints at the back. Unfortunately, a lot of joints get arthritic, and this is where arthritis can occur. Where do you think arthritis is more commonly to occur within our spine? Neck? Thoracic spine or lumbar spine? Yeah, it's the lumbar spine. The lumbar spine is more prevalent to osteoarthritic changes because it's got most load going through it. We have load coming up from below with walking and force. We have the weight of our upper body, our arms and our head. That's got to be quite a few, that's got to be quite a few kilos. And then we also have gravity. So gravitational force also is going to have a sense of, oh, just have a little bit of a look at that disc with gravity. Now, some people I know, they don't really give a shit about gravity. They might feel a little bit like this. And our job is to start to have a sense of consciousness about decompression. Decompression within our spine to allow more fluidity, to allow more health, to allow more space, to prevent degeneration, to help our muscles function, and to help our balance through our front body and back body. Because if we are not in that sense of resisting, we are going to be in a sense of compromising many different aspects of our body in relation to our posture alignment, structure, therefore reflecting in our function. That was one of my very big understandings at osteopathy school, where structure governs function. And it can be reciprocal. If we look at our structure and we have injury, trauma, for example, through our structure, do you think there is going to be some sense of being compromised through the function? Yes. 
What if we look at that in the opposite way? Do you think function or dysfunction can affect our structure? Oh yeah. If we are in a dysfunctional pattern in life, for example, if we have a sense of dysfunction, then that dysfunction, say I've been typing all day and I'm sitting typing like this, this muscle here is not functioning in a correct manner. This muscle here called the trapezius is working far too hard and therefore do you think the structure of that muscle might change if it's not functioning correctly? Oh yes, big time. It may become more fibrous, it may become tighter. It's almost like the volume knob is turned up in relation to the nerve firing in that muscle because it's working too hard then that in itself can start to create dysfunctions in a variety of other areas in our body. How the whole shoulder functions as a, as, as a unit, the shoulder girdle, looking up into the muscles, up into the neck, maybe a cause of headaches, for example. Maybe kind of putting the spine off to one side or the other side. So structure governs function reciprocally. Function governs structure is a really important thing to remember in relation to our anatomy and movement and functionality. So just take, take that away with you and think about that in relation to application of yoga, application of movement, application of your life from day to day. What's your function? How are you functioning in life? How are you choosing to be here in life with your anatomy, with your body? because how you are in life is going to be very much manifested within your physiology, your psychology, your, your body, your mind, body and spirit. We are a map of our lives, which I think is, is amazing. And I think we need to be really conscious of that to, to get an understanding of our structure and therefore our function. Let's come back to the spine. Now, what I'm going to do is speak about the intervertebral disc. Now, I think I used this in one of my last lectures, but I want you to imagine that this is like a disc, okay, that red one. And what I'd like you to imagine, imagine that this is a donut. Mmm, I could nail a donut right now. We have a vertebrae above and a vertebrae below. And we have a sense of this cushioning, okay, within the disc. Now, the outside of the disc, your donut, your dough, is very, uh, it's sturdy. It has a sense of integrity. It's not fluid. It's, it has a sense of containment. And the discs are, uh, the structure of the discs are very firm. They're called fibrocartilage. Fibro meaning fibrous. And there's a lot of fibro uh, fibers, fibrous fibers within the disc, which makes them wow, really, really strong. Say similar to plastic. Now, what happens to plastic if it gets degenerative and it gets old? It will start to fracture, and this is what can happen to discs. Okay. Let's just go back. What have you got in the middle of your donut? Yeah, you've got the jam. And we've got jam, for example, within the disc. We have that sense of fluidity that is contained within our disc. Now, different movements of the spine that I had just spoken to you about, flexion, forward fold, extension, back bends, side bendings, coming into the side angle triangle, etc., and rotations in your twists, all have an influence on your discs. Now, within my fantastic little tool that I hear that I love so much, I'm so pleased I bought it, have a look to see, and I want you to get a sense of where's your jam going, okay? So if I come into, this would be flexion. Now, flexion is where we're doing our forward folds, for example, and I bring my body into flexion, rolling forwards. When I come into flexion, the knobbly bits on the back of our spine open up. Okay, now what's that doing to our joints? Have a look at the joints here. Can you appreciate, whoop, up this way. 
can you appreciate that this joint, the joints at the back of the body in flexion, wow, they're opening. And what's happening to the content of the disc? Which way is the jam going? The jam here is moving backwards. So in flexion, the joints open and the jam moves back. I'm going to show you what happens if something goes wrong. Okay, so we'll do that in a minute. We've done flexion. When we come into extension, back bends, start to appreciate what happens to the joints in the back body. They start to oppose, they come together, okay? And when they oppose and they come together, we come into this movement called extension, okay? And can you see which way the jam is now moving within the, um, within the, the donut? Here we see the jam is coming forwards, okay? Within the jam, within the donut. So flexion, the jam moves back, the joints move open. In extension, the joints oppose and the jam shoots forward, still within the containment of the donut, okay? Right, I'm gonna follow my body. I'm gonna come into a side bending left and start to see which way the jam's gonna move and it's gonna move to the right. If I side bend left, the jam moves to the right. What's going to happen at the joints at the back? If you side bend left, which side's going to close and which side's going to open? We will see if you side bend left, the joints at the back will close and the joints on the opposite side, on the right side, start to open. So side bending left, joints close on the left, joints open on the right and the jam goes off to the right okay totally the opposite if we side bend right the jam goes to the left the joints open up on the left okay so this is really helpful to know if we 